Good morning, everyone. Uh, the word of God today is Romans chapter 2, from verse 28 through 29. Let's look at Romans chapter 2, from verse 28 through 29. Romans chapter 2 from verse 28. A man is not a Jew if he is one, only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. And the title of today's message is Circumcision of the Heart by the Spirit. We'll look at today's message with that title. So last week, uh, we looked at Romans chapter 1, which taught us about the godless people who turned to idolatry of their own created sin. So without God, but then just turning to our own creations. And this was sin. And from leaving God, being godless, the bottom falls out. And we see the depravity of sin in Romans chapter 1. And we continue with Romans chapter 2, this profound letter of the Apostle Paul that pierces Rome, right? This is Paul's letter to Rome. But what is the Rome of today? That is America. So it is a profound letter we should see that also pierces us uh, as well in our lives. So uh, this chapter is interesting. Uh, before we looked at the godless people and how the bottom falls out in sin. But this chapter is directed towards the Jews. Right? This chapter in Romans chapter 2 is directed towards the Jews. But if you look closely, even in the message to the Jews, there is speaking a, power, a message to the powerful Romans. Right? There's a message like that to the powerful Romans. Uh, and there's a message to us too. So how is that? Uh, let's look in verse uh, Romans chapter 1. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 from verse 1 through 11. We'll look at Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. We'll look at uh, today's message in three parts. This is the first part from verse 1 through 11. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, yet do the same things, do you think that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who persist who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. So uh, this part of the letter, Romans chapter 2, is to the Jews. And we know Paul was the Jew of all dogmatic Jews. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees, the Jew of Jews, very dogmatic. But he is saying we have a problem, right? We Jews, we Pharisees, we have a problem with our faith system, is really what he's trying to say throughout Romans chapter 2. We have a, a problem with our faith system. So the Pharisees, there was the written law in the Old Testament, but Pharisees stacked up, you know, 600 additional like policies of faith, basically, that they wrote in order to maintain the faith. So again, they had the 600, they had the, the law of the Old Testament, but they added 600 additional policies of faith in order to maintain the faith that was in really the Old Testament. They you know, wrote here and there, policies there and there, how to do this, be specific in that, you know, categories in this way. And why did they want to do this? Well, think about it from the Pharisees' perspective. Uh, they wanted assurance for their faith. They really believed in the written code, 
the written law. They really believed in that. And so they wanted assurance for that. And they wanted assurance that they were really following that law in the Old Testament. And they really wanted to show that they were following it well. And so they made all these policies and showing that they were a good person. Right? I'm a good person following the law uh, compared to those other sinners. Right? Compared to those other sinners. So Jesus, he spoke about this, right? Uh, you know the famous parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So the Pharisee prayed, you know, I'm so good, God. No, I'm so good. I fast. I give offering. You know, I'm not like that other sinner over there. Right? And, and who is he pointing to? He was pointing to the tax collector. So while the Pharisee was standing, oh, I'm so good, God. And then there was a tax collector bent down, kneeling to his ground, to the ground, you know, head down, beating his breast, saying, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. So Jesus asked, you know, who really has the better image before God? Oh, the one going, look, God, I fast. I give a tenth of all I get. And I do all these things for you. And I'm not like that other guy or this other person who's saying, oh, God, I'm a sinner. And Jesus asked, who has the better image before God? But, you know, when you really look at it, you know, the Pharisee that Jesus was speaking about, us Romans, us Americans, you know, it's the same exact thing, you know, really, when you think about it, you know, the same self-righteous image that I have, you know, this is the, this is really the sickness that we have. We have this self-righteous image that, you know, I'm good, God, look at all the things I'm doing before you, and we stack up these things, the Pharisee said, I fast, I give offering, you know, I do these type of things. And so what are we doing? We're, we're stacking up this, 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 this. And what we're really doing is we're, we're drawing a circle around ourselves, right? We're drawing a circle around ourselves. You know, uh, last week I was teaching, um, um, you know, deeply um, various, uh, uh, to various uh, people, various American uh, people in our church that, um, at another training at another church and it really resonated with them the American dream when I talked about this now, what is the American dream uh, it's talking about you know studying right studying go to college get a job uh, buy a house get a family raise a family you know get get some savings let's get some savings together and then we travel and so you know when I talked about this to Americans from all around the country I was at this this meeting with them and, and I was talking to them about them this really resonated with it oh the American dream right this American dream and and that's what we're doing we're stacking up these categories right we're stacking up these categories like this drawing this circle right and that's what we do we do we, we talk about these things but not only that you know it goes beyond we start making really detailed things about it you know these I'm talking about self-made categories according to things like money, my looks, my popularity, you know, how many social media followers that I have. You know, we, we stack up, right? We stack up here and there. And like the Pharisees, we draw a circle around ourselves based on those categories of self-righteous things, right? Self-righteous things. And, and these, are, these are the things that sort of support me. My circle sort of supports me, right? I define them and this circle supports me. And, and I just need to keep within that, right? And I need to keep within, you know, studying, college, job, house, family, these things, my money, my looks, my popularity, all these things, I, I just keep in those things. But what happens when we start creating these categories and being within my own circle? Well, I just need my own circle. I need my own circle, then I don't need God, right? And, and that's, that's what happens. When I draw my own circle by these own categories, then I just need my own self-righteous categories, and then I don't need other things, and I don't need God. You know, do you know how many people, when I talk to them, you know, I mean, it's like this. If you try to go evangelize, and, and, or people come newly to your church, and you, you, you talk to them about God, uh, and I have family members like this. I talk to them about God. Oh, we really need Jesus. You really need God. But you know what the response is from so many people out there? Uh, I'm good. Right? I'm good. 
right? Isn't that the response? What does I'm good mean? It means two things. It means I'm good and I don't need you, right? I don't need God. I don't need what you're saying, right? I'm good and I don't need whatever you're, whatever you're saying. So, you know, people are like that. We say I'm good as if all, all things are good in life. You know, there was the famous philosopher, uh, Nietzsche, right? And he, with pride, said, we are Superman. <laughs> you know, that's what he declared. We are Superman, and I don't need God. He's saying that I'm mature on my own. That's what he's basically saying in his philosophy, right? We, we have become Superman. And we don't need God. I am mature on my own, right? This was the philosopher Nietzsche. This was basically his philosophy. And so, you know, that's how it is, these categories for our own circle. Now, you know, if I talk about some of these things, like, you know, studying and working hard and getting, you know, you know working hard and, and some of these things about the American dream, you know, are they, are they bad things? You know, you know are, is the law, right? Is the law and what the Pharisees are saying in the law, are they bad things? Well, no, of course, there, there are good things. There are good things about it. But what is the problem with the Pharisees? And what is the problem with these so, so-called good things that we have uh, that we're making categories about? It's that we twist, right, is what we do. We twist. We twist good and holy things to our own benefit. And what that makes us is a hypocrite, right? Paul is trying to say that here, really, in, in verse 1 through 3. I'll read it again. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else for whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them, yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? So what is he trying to say here? He's saying, so we've drawn this circle around ourselves by our own defined categories. And what I need to do is I just need to generally fit within the circle I drew, right? That's how the Pharisees were, right? They, they made policies according to what they could generally fit in uh, under the law based on their own definitions. And I'm doing that too. I'm drawing this general circle around myself so I generally fit in that and so that I'm generally a good person, right? I'm a good person. That's what we say. I'm a good person. Do you know how many people say that? Oh, I'm a good person. You're a good person. No, oh, that person sort of fits in my circle of the defined good person. But then other people, right? I'm within the circle of I'm a good person. But then this other people, they're not a Jew, right? I'm a Jew, right? I'm a real Jew, but they're not a Jew. They're not meeting the defined categories. They're not included in my circle. And so, you know, what happens? So I've, I've drawn the circle. I'm, I'm generally fit in my own shell, like this own little shell of my own little world. But what happens when I falter? Right? This is verse four. This is verse four, Romans chapter two and verse four. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? So, you know, really what he's talking about is taking advantage of God's, God's mercy, kindness and love. So we see when it comes to my own shell, right? when it comes to my own shell, my own boundaries, my own circle, I can... I'm generally a good person. So, you know, when it comes to sin, I can make mistakes and sin, but others cannot. They're sinners. They're categorized as sinners, but I'm not. I'm a good person. I'm categorized as a good person. They're categorized as sinners. And mercy, mercy comes to me. And we judge people like that. We judge other people. They are outside my circle. This is what self-power does. When I'm self-righteous in my self-power, then I'm good right? I'm good. But what does that do? It, it also means that, that at the same time that I think I'm self-righteously good, I'm also blind. I'm blind in like this shell. I'm blind, like just like locked into to this circle. I'm blind outside of it. And so really, we need to know this. We are spiritually blind. We're spiritually blind in our own shell and in our own circle. You know, do you know this? Do we really know this? Do you know that you are blind, right? We all claim we can see, but do you really know that you are blind, right? Or self-righteousness keeps us blind, right? We really need to think about this and really need to meditate. I'm blind, you know, when I'm in my own shell, I, sometimes I don't even know I'm blind. The shell keeps us blind. 
And instead of God's kindness, what is God's kindness supposed to do? It's supposed to lead us to repentance. But, you know, when I'm on my own shell, when I'm on my own little circle, I just keep repeating and repeating and repeating and judge others, right? Judge others who are, who are not in it. And most of all, in verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's uh, wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So stubbornness, right? I'm very stubborn. Right? Do you know how many stubborn people I meet? I'm stubborn too, you know, but really, do you know how many stubborn people I meet in church? You know, trust me, you know, church people were the most stubborn. I'm stubborn. You know, ask my wife. You know, I'm the most stubborn person she probably knows. <laughs> you know, or I was, I'm always very stubborn, you know, but, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful maybe. God calls me in church, so maybe these days I'm stubborn for God. <laughs> you know, we need to be like that. Stubborn people are good because they can be stubborn for God, but, you know, that's what we need to know. We're stubborn. You know, we're all stubborn people. And I meet people and, uh, you, know, you know, everybody has their own thoughts. Right? Oh, how I live and my own ways. And we're so stubborn. Right? Stubborn and in my life and in my purpose. We're so stubborn about it. This is how it should be. Right? I cannot go across my own boundaries. Right? You know, you know how many people at church say that? Oh, this is this is my boundary. Right? This is how Americans are. This is this is my boundary. God, don't don't cross, don't cross into my boundary. Right? And I'm gonna stubbornly keep my, my, my boundary, right? But, you know, the Bible, truth, God, God is clear about how we should live. You know, that the stubbornness, the inflexibility that I have, the unwillingness I have to change, you know, my circle, my shell, it's like, you know, I'm not going to cross across my boundaries. My boundaries are righteous. That's what we say, right? When, when we talk about my boundary, what are we saying? We're saying that I'm a good person, and my boundaries that I'm creating around myself, they're good. They're good boundaries. But what's the problem? We're blind. We're so blind. Don't you know that God is way above my boundary lines? God is way beyond us. You know, he is way beyond my stubbornness and my boundary lines. And what that actually doing, what, what, what Paul is saying here, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, right? we're so unrepentant. You're storing up wrath. That's all we're doing, actually. We're just storing up wrath, right? And, and uh, you know, we need to know that God's wrath and God's judgment, this is not based on anything that, that I can categorize or I can do. Right? That's what we think. We think, oh, here's my circle, and then God's judgment is going to be based on my boundary and my circle. No, that's not, that's not what's going to happen. And I tell you, that's not what's going to happen. It's not that God's judgment is going to come based on what I think, my righteousness, my boundary line. It's not based on my truth. It's not based on what I think is righteous. You know, it's that my stubborn boundary line will be judged no matter how righteous I think, and how righteous I think I am, and how good I think my categories are. You know, the truth will come out. Because God does not show favoritism, right? He says this, if you look from verse 6 through 11 again, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who persist in doing good, seek glory, honor, immortality, he will give eternal life. So this is the true person, is what he's talking about here. The ones who are persisting by doing good with a good, earnest heart, right? But those who are self-seeking, this is the ones drawing the boundary lines around themselves, who reject the truth, right? It's because I'm creating my own boundary and my own truth and not God's truth, right? And follow evil, there will be wrath and anger, right? Because how am I supposed to know what is good and what is evil? I don't know. It's just God, God knows, and we have faith in God. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory and honor for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. God doesn't show favoritism based on my categories. That's what we need to know. This is a deep wisdom that the Apostle Paul is giving us. So God judges based on the truth, not based on our standard. Let's continue on. Let's look from verse 12 through 27. 
from verse 12 through 27. All those, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are the law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience and also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor for the foolish, a teacher of the infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself who preach against stealing? Do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rub temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemy among Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you have not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised. The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a law breaker. And so really, what do we see here as we read uh, these sets of passages here? Uh, the Jews, they thought the law would protect them, right? That's what they thought. They thought the law would protect them, that their own categories, uh, primarily, Paul is pointing out circumcision, that their own categories like circumcision, the boundaries that they draw, you know, that's going to protect us. God will give mercy within those boundaries. So that's how we are too. We think our boundary lines of good will protect us. That as long as I'm under a self-defined good person, <laughs> really a lot of people are like this. They think I'm a good person, right? You're a good person. I'm a good person. My friend, oh, my friend. Oh, I think he's a pretty good person. And so we think like that, me and my friends and the people around me, I'm a good person. And we think that will protect us, but no, we will still be judged based on our sin. And Paul is saying, actually, our sin is greater. You know, if we know the law, if we really know the law, and we really think we're really with God, and then we still sin, then that sin is actually greater. And so, you know, what's the problem here? You know, what am I talking about in terms of the problem here? So this, this boundary line, this circle I have, this self-righteous circle I have, what does it do? What happens is, is that we lose fear of judgment, right? We lose fear of judgment because we're inside the circle. That's what happens to us. We lose fear of judgment because we're inside the circle. We think, I'm a pretty good person. Me and my friends were pretty good people in my circle. And so these other sins that we have, we think we can rationalize it, right? We, we begin to rationalize sins. God's going to have mercy on it. We begin to rationalize it. We're very clever. We're very clever about this, right? There are these categories that keep me as a good person. So then these other sins, this clever, sneaky sin that I have, that, you know, I... I, you know, I'm, I'm still going to be protected because I'm generally a good person, right? I'm generally a good person and I can rationalize. I can say, you know, I, I'm still your, your person, God. God, I'm still one of your people, God. So, you know, this, this sin you can ignore because I'm generally a good person. I'm, I'm before you, God, I'm still a person of God. So, you know, we think we can sin, right? We think and we can rationalize the sin. And so, you know, we really have to know this or sneakiness or cleverness. You know, when it comes to sin, you know, let me tell you something when it comes to sin. Sin is not a sin just because I know if it's a sin or not. It's not based on my judgment, right? So when, when there's a sin out there, and so whether or not I can rationalize or I think it's a sin or if I think it's not a sin, or I can come up with a reason for knowing whether it's a sin or not a sin, it's not based on those things. It's not based on my judgment of whether I think it's a sin or not a sin. All sin is based on God's truth only. It's only based on God's truth, right? That's what we need to know. It's not, it's not an internal generation of a definition of sin. 
right? Sin is on an absolute category from God, right? It transcends or judgment. So, you know, we can think about all the categories we want. We can think about all the, the, the circle around me that's going to protect me, and then I lose fear. You know, I know the sin, but then I, I keep on sinning. This is the ugly image that we fall into. We, we, we lose fear for sin, and then I just keep on sinning. This is the ugly image that I have. You know, I went to a, a very competitive high school. And at the year end, um, at the very year end, uh, when we were seniors, uh, they published uh, the colleges that, uh, you know, everybody went to. So there was like a list of colleges, all the colleges, and then the list of colleges they went to. And because it was a very competitive high school, uh, there were a lot of elite colleges out there that people went to. And so there was like all these elite colleges. I mean, it's very obvious, you know, the Harvards and the Berkeleys and the UCLA's and all these, you know, you know, top, top ranked schools, right? And, and the people that went to there. And then there was these other people and it also published where they went to, community college, right? Community college. And, you know, I remember so many people feeling so self-righteous, me included. I, I, was, I was definitely, definitely guilty of this. Feeling so self-righteous. Oh, the boundary line, elite? not elite, <laughs> something like this, right? And, you know, I'm on the elite side and looking down, right? Looking down at the other person. Oh, you go to community college? And I felt safe in, in my line. But you know, really, when you think about this, you know, this is what you come to know when you're in life after you graduate college and then you really, you're like really in life. You know, does your college name protect you? Oh, you know? I went to UCLA and my college name protects me. No, you realize there's nothing like that. You learn, you still have to live life's challenges and everybody has to live life's challenges. And so, you know, you really think about it. You know, why, why did these people go to, why, why, did, why did some other people in my high school go to community college? Well, there's many reasons. Could be financial. It could, could have nothing to do with these smug feelings that you're feeling, oh, I'm smarter than them. I'm better. I'm more elite than them could have nothing to do with some of those smug feelings that we, we have. And actually my smug feelings of being in some good college, it, you know, it, it, makes, it, it actually makes my judgment even worse. That's what we need to know. Smug feelings about how good of a person that I am, that makes judgment even more serious for that person. And this is what we need to know, right? That I'm a good person, that I think I'm a good person, that makes life's judgment even, that makes judgment even more serious because the smugness, the building up of the good categories that I'm living, self-sufficient, oh, the American ideal life. You know, do you think that, that, that that's actually like building that up? Do you think that'll protect me? No, that doesn't happen. It's actually building up more wrath, right? That's what it does. It builds up more wrath. And, it, and, I, and we need to know I'm a sinner and I'm still going to be judged. You know, even though I'm a good person, God, God, I'm good before you. You know, all our sin is going to be judged. You know, we need to know this. You know, Hebrews chapter 9, let's read this. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, let's read this. Just as man, just as a man, is just destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So man dies, right? Man dies and then we face judgment. So, you know, when, when I'm there, when I'm there facing judgment after I die before God, do you think it's going to be based on my standard and a circle of good that I drew, right? That I have this, this, and that, and, 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 and because, you know, God, I'm your person, right? And, and I can define that I'm your person by this and by that, then God, you're going to accept me into heaven because I fit into that. Well, no, it's not going to be like that. No, all my sins, all my sins are going to be judged accordingly. Whether it be a little sin or a big sin, we need to know this too, right? That's what we do when we're making these categories, right? Big sin, little sin, all of these things, all sin, all sin prevents me from going heaven. Do you think heaven is a place that has sin inside of it, right? That I'm going to take this, I'm a, I'm a good person, Lord, but I'm just going to take this little sin with me into heaven? You know, no, heaven is perfect. Heaven is perfect. It is a place without sin. 
right? Heaven is perfect. It is a place without sin. And I'm not protected by being a good person when I'm still a hypocrite. <laughs> that hypocritical part about me, that is sin also. No, it's, it's just like that. It's, it's just like I, I said, you know, the college name, it doesn't protect me. It doesn't protect me in terms of life's, life's judgments. You know, it's the same thing. You know, being a good person, it doesn't protect me. It does not protect me from God's judgment. I will still be judged according to my sin. That's the reality of judgment. We need to know that, that that is at the end of life. That is the reality of judgment. And there's no avoiding that. I cannot, we cannot sugarcoat this, that there is a reality of judgment. And it is wisdom to fear God and his judgment. We need to know our insufficiencies, right? That all the things I'm drawing a circle around about my own sufficiency, I, 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 there's nothing, there's nothing like that before judgment and before God. There is wisdom in fearing God and his, and his judgment and his wrath. You know, we need to know this. We need to have it. Because even though, you know, there's no way for me in order to meet God's judgment, but there is a way, right? There is a way even despite the fact that I'm a sinner. Let's look at that. This is in verse 28 and 29. It's the last part. Romans chapter 2 and verse 28 and 29. It's also the title of today's message. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. So it's not by outward things, right? It's not by these outward things that we usually default to. You know, isn't that how we are? We, like, our default like that. We default in our own circle, our own shell, and what we're used to doing. But just because I acknowledge myself and my own boundaries, is God going to acknowledge us like we want to? And this is what we need to know. The gospel, the gospel is not for the self-seeking ones. The gospel is not for the ones that have their stubborn, strict boundaries about what I do and how I fulfill myself. The gospel is about the ones with an empty heart, the empty ones with uh, an empty heart. It's when I'm humble, right? That's what the gospel is about. It's about the humbleness, the humble ones, humble in heart. Jesus said in his first blessing on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. It is the humble ones, the poor in spirit. It is the ones with their hearts open. It's not for the self-seeking ones, but it is the ones seek, with their heart open seeking from God, accepting from God who is above us. So it's not about outward circumcision, right? It's not about outward circumcision, drawing my own circle, but it is inward circumcision. It is circumcision of the heart. Right? It is circumcision of the heart to accept God's, God's gifts. Well, what is faith? Faith is circumcision of the heart. And I want to say that to you today. Faith is circumcision of the heart. What it is, is this tiny open, tiny opening in my heart. It's when my heart is opening like that. That's what faith is. It is the opening of my heart to accept from God. Right? That is circumcision of the heart. Faith is opening up ourselves to a relationship with God and embracing him. And I need to have an open heart. I need to have an open heart to receive his love. You know, really, it is the ones with an open heart that can receive God's love. That even though I'm a sinner, you know, the tax collector beating his breast saying, I'm, I'm a sinner. Uh, that is more honest, right? That heart, that heart of being more honest and more trying to receive from God, that is better. That is much better than a good person, right? Quote, unquote, good person with a, the with a circle around them. It's more the sinner who is honest, right? This is more honest. This is more, you know, God, God looks at that person better, really, than the good person, the Pharisee. You know, of course, traditions, laws, boundaries, these are, you know, these things that we talk about, these are good, but if we only focus on the outward things and then we're not honest on the inside, then it's all useless. That's what we need to know. Right? If, there's no, if it's all outward circumcision, but there's no circumcision of the heart, then it's all useless. It's not about my ability and my intellect, what I'm doing good before God. It's all useless. That is all useless if there is no heart. 
I think the Apostle Paul was so very honest here. You know, I think the Apostle Paul was a very honest and genuine person, really. He has a great attitude. He's always questioning things about himself. The fact that he was such a dogmatic Jew also at the same time made him a person that really questioned and self-examined himself. And that's what he's really doing here in Romans chapter 2. He's breaking down himself, looking at himself, confessing his insufficiency that I'm a sinner. You know, we're all a sinner. And we need to do this too. We need to self-examine ourselves. You know, the problem I'm having, is it because I'm so stubborn? I'm stubborn in my own thinking, in my own categories, in my own definition of truth. And in that same way, I'm being self-righteous. <laughs> really, we need to know that. Whether or not I understand a stand is if I'm just being stubborn, I'm still going to be judged in the end anyways. You know, we need to know this. This is a wisdom. That's wisdom. We need to confess that I'm a sinner. I'm a, I'm a sinner, not because I understand I'm a sinner, but we need to confess that we're all sinners. We're all sinners and there's no getting around it. Right? That is the nature of fallen man. Right? And, you know, there was someone like this. Uh, I remember I was praying with someone. So someone prayed and realized this. They realized they're you know, they're a sinner. They realize they're a sinner. They, they realize they're a sinner and they realize that they have sin. They don't even know that, that, that it was sin. They said, you know, uh, I, when, I was a, when I was a baby, I, I bit my, my mom's breast. <laughs> you know, I hurt my mom. You know, when I was, when I was breastfeeding, I hurt, I hurt my mom when I was biting the breast. And then, you know, they realized, well, even that, even that sin, I'm, <laughs> I have sin. I don't even know that was sin, right? And they did it even when they were baby. And you know, we need to know this. There's something like this. You know, I'm a sinner. I don't even know what I'm sinner. I can't even prevent that I'm a sinner. I just am. You know, that's wisdom, actually. This is having an empty heart. I'm a sinner. And I really, I can't even do anything about this. And when I have honesty like this, right? This is, this is really being honest in faith. Oh, you know, I don't even know what sin is. I don't even know the sin I'm committing. And then I'm committing this sin. I'm committing sin. I know I'm committing sin. I don't know. Oh, this honest person, the tax collector, okay? the circumcision of the heart, when I confess this and I have this honesty, that is the starting point of faith. Because, you know, what is the way, you know, that, you know, when I'm, Appearing before God and judgment, and there's all my sins, whether big or little, the sins I knew and I didn't even know that I committed, and that's preventing me from going to heaven because heaven is a perfect place. You know, what is, it, what is the way which, when I can appear before God uh, when, when, at the end like that? It is, it is that Jesus Christ walked the path of the cross humbly and obediently before God. He suffered for our sin, taking the punishment for our sin. He didn't do this in any self-seeking way. It wasn't for himself. He was sinless and he was blameless. He was righteous before God. Right? Is there anything that Jesus needed? No, he, he was sinless and blameless before God. It was not in any self-seeking way, but for us. And he took that cross. He bore that cross. He was nailed on that cross. He shed his blood and he died on that cross. And what happened? Three days later, he resurrected and he became a a blessing to us all. He gave us, through Jesus, he gave us the path to eternal life. And by his blood, it washed us of our sin. And we need to follow in that faith. That is receiving the complete grace of God. And that's what we need to know. Receiving grace is the, so much more the most important, the most important thing in our life, really. It's receiving from above. It is not me fitting with within being a good person, but it's receiving. Like that's the most important thing in, in faith. It is receiving from God. So really, you know, really thinking about this today, are you receiving, are you receiving grace in your life? You know, don't focus on producing in yourself. Don't think about defining within yourself, right? Producing, definitions, all these things, they're useless. They're really useless, right? I mean, they're, they're good in order to, to keep us in, in, you know, uh, you know, the law, the law is really good in keeping us in, in, a, in, a, in a good path. But, you know, before God at the end, you know, it's all useless. 
The only thing we need is to receive from above. So we need to receive God's grace, receive the grace of Jesus on the cross. And when we receive in Jesus, that's when we can participate in the resurrection, right? Only when we're receiving Jesus on the cross can we participate in the resurrection and have eternal life. That is the gospel of salvation. It's nothing I do. I'm completely a sinner. But, you know, I'm a completely a sinner and I should be judged. But Jesus saved me by his unconditional love. And this is the grace we must know. I pray that God will help, help us all, help our hearts be circumcised. We need that opening. We need that circumcision of the heart to receive the cross of Jesus. And so in that way, I can receive God's grace from above. Today, Romans chapter 2 is the confession of one of the most dogmatic, self-righteous, disciplined people in history, the Apostle Paul, right? You know, the more, more stubborn than even I am, it was Apostle Paul. And he confesses that everything he did, all the circles, the boundaries, and all of these things that he drew, oh, he's still a sinner. I'm still a sinner even when I don't know that I'm a sinner. And those of us who think we're good, we're good people, I hope we realize that all our efforts are still going to make us a, a sinner. But there's only one thing. It is receiving from above. Let us have the circumcision of our hearts to receive from above, to receive from God, and let his amazing grace of his love and unconditional love flow into our hearts in this way. I pray we can be these ones. Let us pray. Uh, Father God, uh, truly we confess before you that uh, we are sinners before you, Lord. Uh, for Lord, uh, we confess that we are sinners because we think of ourselves as self-righteous. We're hypocritical. We draw boundaries. We say that we're, we're good people, Lord, before you, Lord. But we come to see that uh, this confession of the Apostle Paul, who was the most stubborn, most dogmatic, most following you and your law, Lord, that he still realized also that he is ultimately a sinner. And Lord, we wish to confess that too, that uh, we're stubborn in our own ways. We become hypocrites and we have nothing before you, Lord. Lord, Lord it, it doesn't matter whether we think we're a sinner or not a sinner or all these things, Lord. We come to see that uh, fundamentally, we're flawed before you, Lord. We're estranged before you, and we come to see that we're all sinners. Even when we don't know it, we're sinners before you, Lord. And we wish not to appear to you at the end by our own self-righteous categories, Lord, but we wish to appear to you at the very end with an open heart, with a circumcision of the heart, having faith in you, receiving from above, receiving your Lord, the, your Son, Jesus Christ, your Son, Jesus Christ, who bore that heavy cross for us, who was not self-seeking on that cross, but bore that punishment for us. And that is the only way is we're receiving his salvation, receiving the salvation of Jesus before you, Lord. That is the only way we can appear before you. And we thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace in our life. We thank you that we can confess that we are sinners before you. And Lord, um, your amazing grace and love, uh, we truly thank you for, for that, Lord, in our life. And in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.